Yes, you tell them, Jerry. Oh, hello, boys and ghouls. I was just catching up on some current scares. Well, here we are, Halloween, the most marvelous time of the year. Unfortunately, we can't go out trick-or-treating, but that doesn't mean we can't have a little scary story or two. I thought I might tell you a nice dead time story from my diary. <laughs> now, Here's one you might not have heard before, a wonderful classic. Chapter One, Northern Iraq. The blaze of the sun wrung pops of sweat from the old man's brow, yet he cupped his hands around the glass of hot sweet tea as if to warm them. He could not shake the premonition. It clung to his back like chill, wet, leaves. What, what does this mean? What, what's this? We're not reading The Exorcist. Well, why not? It's a masterpiece. Well, what are we reading? Perhaps something by Ernest Hemingway. That Ernest Hemingway always shooting his mouth off. An Irish ghost story. An Irish horror story. Hmm. Perhaps partition. I read all about it in a fascinating shockumentary. <laughs> I have an idea. A classic from the pan horrors. This is one you might enjoy, boils and ghouls. A horror story about the dead of winter and the cold winter nights. Written by Maureen O'Hara. Was she not in The Quiet Man? Oh. But this is a story that might make you terror your hair out. <laughs> Called The Atheist. The larder was bare, the grate without a fire, and outside the snow fell so deep that Podrick Flaherty could not even venture to open his front door. He sat by the empty hearth, and stared through the television screen back into the abyss of his own desperate mind. Lily didn't say a word. She sat opposite him, staring at her thin, wasted hands, seeing nothing, thinking nothing. The scarf she was trying to knit had fallen from her fingers and lay at her side, its brilliant whiteness incongruous against the dull gray of her long cotton skirt. An ancient, multicolored blanket was draped around her aged shoulders. She grasped its end with her numb fingers and drew it tightly around her frail body. But she was still cold, freezing cold, and she was hungry. If help didn't come, the cold would kill her. It would kill them both and it would be Podrick's fault. He was, and always had been, a worthless incompetent. From a distance there came to her ears the gentle sound of a male voice saying something about helping the aged, about calling on old people to ensure that they were safe and warm and well fed. And then the gentle voice was gone, and on the North of Ireland Channel, there came the voice of the queen, giving her usual festive speech. There was a click and a profound silence. Podrick switched off the television. 
She tried to turn her eyes round to look at him, but she found it difficult to focus. And when he came into her line of vision, he was no more than a small, distorted blur. He came closer, the sound of his walking stick tap-tapping on the cold cement floor. Then he was bending over her, peering into her expressionless face, asking if she was all right. She gave a sudden shudder and was still again. I'm so cold, Podrick. Now don't be worrying, Lily. He stroked her ice-cold, sunken cheek. Someone is bound to come. Someone is bound to think of us and come. He sat again in the chair opposite her and stared at her wretched face and kept on staring at her as if she were the sole source of his thoughts. He knew no one would come. The nearest house was a good half mile away. Padraig didn't know who lived there. He didn't know anyone in the area of Monaghan, except, of course, Father Murphy. It was less than a month now since he had bought this old house, situated at the end of a lane that stretched a whole mile up into the hills. The home in the town of Monaghan had been burnt to the ground, and no insurance, no insurance. Padraig Flaherty, you fool. The snow had begun to fall the day following their move here to Cray Martin. Padraig had walked the mile and a half to Barker's grocery store and bought a quantity of food. He had been sure the food would see them over Christmas. Now it was Christmas Day and the shop would be closed. And in any case, how could he even begin to try and force his way through the two feet of snow that covered the lane to get to the nearest house for help? Oh. He had ordered coal as well, had told Barkers to send them in with a couple of bags on Christmas Eve, had warned them not to forget. But the coal didn't come, and now the grate was empty, and he was cold, and Lily was cold. Pray, Padraig Flaherty, pray that she doesn't die, for where in the name of the Pope would you find the money to bury her? The garden would do as far as he was concerned, but what would Father Murphy say to that? Hmm? Excommunicate him with a bit of luck. You'll die yourself, you fool, if you don't get a fire to warm you and a bite of food in your stomach. Not even 70 yet, another 10 years of life in your body if you can just get warmth and food to see you till, till the snow abates and melts away. But look at your wife, too far gone to look anything like alive, too far gone to talk, to scourge him with her razor-edged tongue. She had yapped and nagged for years, ever since the day he had walked her up the aisle. That was a long time ago, and now, looking back, oh, it seemed twice as long. Still, she wasn't bad. He loved her. Podrick Flaherty. Cannot even be truthful with your own self and admit that you hate her. That you wish she was dead and that she was burning in hell years ago. God, this unbearable cold. He drew his eyes away from her and turned his head to the window. It was still snowing. Water seeped in through the galvanized roof and came tripping through the ceiling, splashing onto the floor in the corner of the sitting room. The sound of the monotonous drip, drip, drip caused friction in his nerves. He hobbled to the television, switched it on, and turned the volume up high. Now the sound of the drip was gone, and he couldn't hear the television either. And there was two of Lily now, two of the wasted woman, swaying in and out of each other. It was cold, a whole week without any source of warmth, getting the better of him. His toes were like ice, his stomach a cavity, full of nothing but wind and pain. He closed his eyes and tried to sleep. No, don't sleep, you fool. You'll never wake up. He looked at Lily again and for a moment thought he thought from her lack of expression that she was dead. No, no, there was still a flicker of life. Her eyelids fluttered and a tongue came out and licked her dry, chapped lips. Lily, he said her name softly. Why don't she go to bed? It'd be warmer. 
She didn't answer, showed no sign of hearing him. She just sat and stared as before, seeing nothing, thinking nothing. If he wasn't so preoccupied with himself, he might even feel sorry for her. But he was very worried about himself. His body had been trembling with cold for the past hour, and now it wasn't even trembling anymore. He forced his eyes to remain opened. If you've got to die, Podrick, then at least let it be said that you outlived her. That you outlived the wife who had spent all of her life blatantly debasing you. A poor, helpless man. It would have been all right. The marriage would have been fine and wholesome and happy if it hadn't been for the religious differences. She believed, and he didn't. In the early days, he had pretended to believe because he was so much in love with her. He had got out of his warm bed before dawn every morning and trudged with her to St. Michael's for the six o'clock mass. But when they had been married, he had let her know the truth, that he was an atheist, even though he had been born a Catholic, and she had scourged him ever since. You'll not let on to no one, she had ordered. You'll come to the chapel with me every morning before you go to work. So for countless years, he had followed her like a timid schoolboy to St. Michael's. And every Saturday there was the humility of confession and Lent. And that, and that was the worst of all. She let him neither smoke nor drink, and because he had no trade and a lame foot that prevented him from working on the farms, she had made him go out and do a housekeeping job, washing nappies, washing knickers, cooking and scouring, year in and year out, while she sat with her beads and prayed. By God, Padraig, that wasted woman of a wife, put you through some hell. And all the while, telling you it was for the sake of ending up in heaven. By God, he could kill her. Couldn't you just, Padraig? Oh God, this unbearable cold. His eyes turned outwards from his own furious thoughts and came to rest on her again. Her lips were moving and she was mumbling, poor woman. In spite of everything, he now felt just a little bit sorry for her. The past, wicked for him though it may have been, was over, and he'd forgive her now. She was near her end. What was she saying? He cocked his ear and listened. The Lord is with thee, and blessed art thou amongst women, holy Mary, mother of God. Oh, the insufferable hag. Her own prayer seemed to give her strength, and her voice grew in pitch and became strong and steady. And when she had finished this prayer, she looked across at him, the blankness gone, her expression now haughty and formidable. Are ye not down on your knees, Podrick? Get down on them. Get down on your knees and pray with me. He sat where he was and scowled at her. Did you not hear me? She shouted angry, and he flinched under her gimlet stare. He braced himself and spoke. I'll ask ye, Lily, is your sudden renewed strength coming from God at all? Tis maybe from the devil you're getting it, <laughs> I'll be thinking. It took nerve to speak like that to the woman he feared so much, and now he was shaking, not from cold, no, from nerves. She rose stiffly and came slowly to where he sat, her feet dragging across the floor. There was fury in her colorless eyes. She looked down at him as God might look down upon a fallen angel, and he emitted a petrified little squeak. Without warning, she grasped the back of his chair and with a hefty push from her thin hand, heeled it forward, sending him onto his knees on the floor. Now, in the name of the Blessed Virgin, begin the rosary with me and let your blackened soul be saved. In a frightened whimper, he said, well, will you just let me get the beads, Lily? 
That's more like it now, she said warmly and fell on her knees by the empty hearth. Get me on while you're at it. They're in the cutlery drawer. Will you pray for the cold to come? Ask and ye shall receive. Is that is what he said and he meant it? Go on, get the beads. He rose and went to the kitchen. When he returned, he was carrying a can of paraffin and an old oil stove. Lily, he said excitedly, we could try and get this thing going. She looked upon the stove with disdain. Didn't you say it was broken? That it leaked? Aye, but sure didn't I fix it, Lily? Her eyes burned. Ye mean to tell me that the heater worked and me sitting here freezing for this past week? Why didn't ye tell me ye tried to fix it? I forgot I fixed it, Lily, he said feebly. He hadn't fixed it at all. Ach, you're worse than pathetic, Podrick Flockerty. Will you get it lit now as quick as you can? He fumbled with the heater. I can't get the wick turned up, Lily. Me fingers are numb. <laughs> Ach, give it here, you good for nothing. I'll light it myself. She unscrewed the top from the paraffin can and poured it into the heat, into the base of the Aladdin stove. Sitting on her honkers beside the heater, she didn't notice the oil leaking rapidly from the base and soaked the floor beneath her. Give us a match, she growled. He handed her the box of matches and took a few paces backwards. She flicked the match, held it forwards, a grin on her shriveled face at the anticipation of warmth. There was an explosion. The flames tore rapidly up her legs. She kicked and yelped madly like a demented dog. And then the blaze totally enveloped her. Patrick stood and watched, his eyes agape, his mind a blank. And then in a voice that squeaked, he said, "'Twasn't my fault, Lily, twasn't my fault. And now his mind was no longer blank, for he was thinking, Patrick Flaherty, you're rid of her at last. By God, you've you fixed a pat on the back for this. He came forward and thrust out his arms to warm his numb hands. The heat was glorious, glorious. His blood began to pulsate warmly in his veins again. She was writhing, kicking, convulsing like an epileptic. And then in a moment she was on her feet and bounding across the room straight towards him. He jumped to one side and cowered against the wall, repetitive shrieks of terror rising from his trembling lips. The human inferno was feeling its way along the wall. The blazing hands groping madly for the door, flames leapt from her convulsing body and tore up the wall. Then she was by the door, fumbling for the handle. It came open, and the blazing lily fled like a fiery spectre from the house and rolled in the snow. Get out, Podrick Flaherty. The house is on fire. He fled through the open door and into the dancing snowflakes and tumbled over black and something black and grisly that emanated a vile, repugnant odor. He sat upright in the deep snow, confused and dazed. She sat a yard away from him, and her eyes were looking straight into his. Her skin was burnt and charred everywhere, but she was alive. God, she was alive. She was writhing, crawling to him, and petrified. He could not move. Something hot and black and charred twined itself around his arms. It was her withered hand. Don't worry, Patrick, I'll not die. The good Lord will see to that. I'll be with ye a long time yet. There was a leer on her blistered lips, and when they parted, he saw that her false teeth had melted into a pulp. She spat them out, and hot, frothing saliva ran in a rivulet down a wrinkle in her chin. He dragged her his arm away from the grasp of her fingers. She let out a yelp of agony. Some of the charred flesh 
had come away from her hand and was clinging to his sleeve. Then she was leering at him through her lashless, bloodshot eyes, bright white in the blackened wreck of her face. His stomach heaved. A shot rang out like an explosion in his mind. He rose to his feet and looked back wildly at the house, now burning and crackling its way to the ground. He found himself limping through the snow towards the door, horror and nausea gyrating inside himself. Through the door he limped, straight into the arms of the flames. And now he prayed his first earnest prayer that he would not survive. Burn, baby, burn. Looks like it was a case of till death do us part for Podrick and Lily. Although I hear they're still together, buried six feet under. Perhaps they'll be soil mates. <laughs> Well, boys and ghouls, I hope you enjoyed that little slice of terror on Halloween. And remember, if you are going to be staying in for Halloween, please wear a mask all year round. Stay safe, enjoy yourselves, and happy Halloween. <laughs>